Здравствуйте! С вами программа «Гипотеза» и я, Лилия Иликова. Сегодня у нас в гостях профессор Левинского университета Кэтлин Малфлит, которая находится в университете по приглашению Центра превосходства Жанна Мане в области европейских исследований. И э, профессор Малфлит согласилась дать нам интервью и рассказать о своей многолетней работе в области исследования отношений между Россией и ЕС. Пожалуйста, доктор Малфлит, как долго вы работали с ЕС-Россией в отношении? Oh, that has been a long time, at least 15 years. Uh, because I, in Leuven, at Leuven mm -hmm. University in Belgium, uh, I had a chair uh, on EU-Russia relations. So uh, for 12 years, uh, I had a special financing for research on uh, the relations between the European Union and mm -hmm. Russia. Uh, but why so interesting topic of uh, your research? Why did you th this choice? Well, my interest is first of all uh, in Russia itself and in, in Russian politics, uh, the way uh, Russia develops uh, its uh, political system. Uh, my uh, PhD was on uh, uh, Soviet personal property. Личная собственность в СССР. Тогда был СССР. In here? Uh, so it was in the middle of the 80s. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and uh, of course, at that moment, uh, there was still the communist system uh, and there was almost no uh, uh, relation, certainly not a good relation mm -hmm. between Russia, the Soviet Union and uh, um, uh, Europe, integrating Europe, uh, but that changed, of course, uh, when um, uh, the Berlin Wall fell uh, and when uh, the Soviet Union mm -hmm. imploded. Uh, at that moment, uh, the relations between uh, the new Russia and the European Union became very important. And you know, the first years uh, in the beginning of the 90s, uh, there was that uh, positive and uh, constructive idea uh, that uh, Russia would really become part of uh, Europe as we saw it at that moment, that uh, Russia would become a member of the European Union. So uh, there was uh, an approach to the situation where Russia would prepare mm -hmm. to enter the European Union and uh, to follow uh, the European uh, rules. But that was not uh, how it ended, of course. Yes, we can see it now. Yes. Uh, but in your personal opinion, was it ever, uh, ever possible for Russia to come to enter the European Union? Was the European Union ready to welcome Russia? in European Union. Well, yeah. well, as a matter of fact, um, when you see how European enlargement to the Central European countries went, um, uh, I think that uh, uh, the European Union was not prepared yeah. even to, um, uh, to welcome uh, the countries, uh, uh, the socialist countries from Central Europe. You know that uh, in 2004, uh, there were seven countries uh, coming in into the uh, European Union, former socialist countries. And this was much for the European Union. Certainly when uh, in 2007, also Bulgaria and mm -hmm. Romania entered the European Union. So indeed, as you say, that Russia would become a member of the European Union, I think that uh, was um, uh, 
well, a thought perhaps, a wish perhaps, that was not practicable, practical uh, and feasible. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, you can say uh, that was not possible, but on the other hand, I must say that Russia uh, in itself is of course partially until the Urals, mm. Russia is Europe. When you look at the geographical concept of Europe, of course. Okay, and um, for you, what period uh, has been the most friendly and most benevolent, favorable in the EU-Russia relationship? In, in your personal opinion as a researcher? Well, certainly it was uh, those few years in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, so when the Berlin Wall uh, fell uh, and even after the implosion of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. uh, there were, uh, well, two or three years where uh, everything was possible. Europe could, could be um, restructured, rethought. Uh, a new idea of Europe could come up, an idea uh, of a Europe that um, uh, would be uh, looked at in its more geographical uh, aspects of a Europe towards the Urals, for example, um, a Europe uh, that uh, would have another relations to the uh, United States, mm. uh, a Europe uh, that uh, could be very creative in the new circumstances after uh, the collapse of, uh, of the communist bloc. It was also the end of the Cold War, don't forget that. Uh, uh, so the Cold War had ended um, and uh, there was a possibility even for peace. Uh, we talked at that moment of the peace dividend. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that uh, we wouldn't be um, um, uh, spending so much money for weapons, uh, for uh, war and uh, the nuclear aspects of war as well. And that money we saw it at that moment, and it was really that opening of the beginning of the 90s, we saw it that that money uh, that we saved from uh, uh, the, the, the all those uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, and uh, weapon uh, expenses, we would save it and uh, work on uh, social protection of people, on uh, the well-being of people, and uh, uh, let's say peace, uh, at least in Europe. And uh, there we, s we, we saw Europe as including Russia as well. Okay. But it didn't happen, of course. Uh, how long was this period of these hopes? Well, I think that the, the window closed already um, in 1993, uh, 1995, mm. uh, and uh, then, well, there became, um, uh, there was some, some problem, first of all, with NATO and NATO mm -hmm. enlargement. Uh, uh, so um, NATO, of course, had lost its mission uh, in a Cold War situation where NATO was the defense pillar of the European Union and uh, where NATO had an enemy of course which was the, 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 the Soviet bloc, the Eastern Bloc. Mm -hmm. um, that Eastern Bloc collapsed and NATO had a problem with its mission and its uh, uh, legitimacy. And at that moment, uh, NATO started to push forward uh, the uh, enlargement of NATO and also the enlargement of the European Union. In my view, it was first of all NATO that wanted to expand to, uh, uh, towards the East. The European Union 
was a bit uh, uh, well forced to do so to enlarge uh, I don't think that it was their strategy or their plan to enlarge towards the east but they were a bit forced to do so yeah yes uh, don't you think it 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 was a good idea to get <laughs> a good influence of NATO to our relationships between the EU and Russia? Well, NATO promised at the mm -hmm. moment of, uh, so after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, NATO promised that they would not enlarge. You towards. remember it? Yes. Of course, yeah. So NATO uh, was not keeping to its words. Yes. Uh, so that is a problem, of course, for the future developments, mm -hmm. uh, because they did. And as you know, the, the, the Kosovo crisis was the first uh, moment where NATO was operating in a way that uh, was not, in my view at least, according to international law. Mm -hmm. So uh, Russia has a point there where, when it says, well, R NATO was not keeping to its uh, promises. And of course, NATO enlarged um, towards uh, the borders of Russia and Russia felt threatened. Um, and Russia, uh, well, started uh, to elaborate a policy of, uh, well, defending its own, yeah, uh, its own interests. Yeah. But on the other hand, of course, um, I would say that Russia itself um, is also not really keeping to its borders. Uh, Russia is uh, thinking as an identity, as a state identity, also outside its borders. So it's not so that uh, that that uh, Russia um, uh, has no ambitions uh, to build something new uh, on the territory of the former Soviet Union. Uh, I think there is indeed uh, a new construction on the way and that is the Eurasian uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, space. You see, you see that uh, situations in such uh, mode that and, and Russia too wants to, to enlarge. Well, uh, I think that Russia, um, uh, well, after the collapse of the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, became indeed a state, um, but the um, confusion that always existed between Russia as an entity and the, the empire, yeah, it was the Tsarist Empire first and then it was the Soviet Union. That confusion was continued, in my view, by the fact that Russia became the successor of the Soviet Union in the Security uh, uh, Council of the United Nations. So Russia took the chair of the in the Security Council of the United Nations from uh, the, the, the Soviet Union. Yeah? So Russia was recognized by the international community as the successor of the Soviet Union in the Security Council. Mm. So, and this is an important aspect for the further um, uh, story about uh, the development of uh, EU-Russia relations as well. Okay, uh, what do you think? Is it possible to develop some cooperation and is still to be existing as a cooperation between EU and Russia for now and maybe um, there are some spheres more successful for you. Yeah. Uh, what well, do you think? Uh, of course, things uh, have changed in a very radical way. Uh, when EU-Russia relations started in the 90s, the European mm. Union was very successful at the top of its success. Uh, the integrated market was a fact. Uh, the um, unified uh, currency, the euro, yeah 
was an, uh, was a reality. So uh, the European Union was very successful at that moment. <coughs> and um, I think that uh, now we came to, to, to uh, quite some problems for the European Union, as you know, uh, the problem with uh, immigration, uh, uh, the whole question uh, of um, uh, the borders of uh, the European Union, but also very fundamental questions on the essence of the European Union. Uh, uh, what kind of construction is the European Union? Is it just mm -hmm. um, a, a kind of uh, liberal concept? concept where uh, competition uh, is the most important principle. What about solidarity in the European Union? All those questions were simply not asked in the beginning of the 90s. But at this moment uh, you can uh, talk about uh, um, a crisis of uh, that identity of the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, we will have to go to a new um, uh, uh, rethinking of the European Union. Uh, the, the individual countries, member states of the European Union will become more important uh, in the relation with Russia also. So I can imagine that uh, uh, Belgium that always had an excellent relation with uh, Russia. Yeah. You know that um, the first Belgian king, he uh, was militarily educated in the Russian army. So the Saxon yeah. Coburgs, always our kings, always had very good relations with the Russian Tsars. Uh, and, and we had a lot of activity in Yekaterinburg, for example. Uh, the, the, the Belgian investors were very active uh, in the, um, uh, uh, the industry of, uh, uh, of heavy metal and so on. So uh, this uh, is a long tradition of cooperation between Belgium mm -hmm. and, uh, and Russia. And you will see that, uh, I think, uh, of course, first of all, Germany and France uh, uh, will establish their own uh, foreign policy and diplomatic relations uh, with Russia uh, and uh, go for it um, uh, with or without the European Union. And that will happen. That will be uh, the development, at least for the following years, mm -hmm. um, that uh, there will be by lateral relations that will be uh, developed uh, while yeah the um relations with the European Union uh, uh, will uh, be confronted with, with problems, not only because of the uh, internal problems of the European Union, but there will there will also be a question, and uh, that was what we discussed in our yeah. conference, uh, there will be a question of, um, okay, what will be the relation between the European Union on the one hand and the Eurasian uh, integrated space on the other hand? Is there a compatibility between uh, the um, uh, membership, for example, yeah. of uh, the European Union on the one hand and uh, the uh, Eurasian Economic Union on the other hand. Uh, for me it's very clear that there is no compatibility. So for example a country as Ukraine will have to make the choice between being a member of the Eurasian Economic Union or the uh, European Union. Uh, and okay. economic factors are very important in that discussion. Um, Ukraine is very dependent from Russia uh, in the field of energy and um, trade and, and so on. So the question is, how will this develop in the, in the future? Uh, all 
all kinds of uh, scenarios are mm -hmm. set out uh, for that uh, future. For example, the possibility of creating uh, a free trade zone uh, between Russia, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, and uh, the European Union. That would be a possibility uh, because at that moment you don't have a real incompatibility between membership of uh, the European Union and uh, that uh, free trade space. Yeah. yeah. So that could be uh, a possible way out of the, um, yeah, uh, of really that uh, situation that became uh, a very uh, complex and difficult uh, situation uh, where uh, the hope for a unified Europe mm -hmm. uh, is already gone at this moment. It will be very difficult uh, to create uh, a, a concept of Europe uh, that, um, uh, that can be uh, accepted by all actors on the scene as um, uh, a unified Europe, I think. Okay, my last question. Uh, in your personal opinion, do you think does any country has a determining role in any country in uh, Europe it has a determining role uh, in the relationship uh, to Russia? Well, like it, France, of course, Germany, of course, it's uh, clear so that Germany is the first country uh, uh, that always had that special uh, uh, interest also mm -hmm. in Central Europe, in Russia, uh, and uh, Germany was unified and uh, is the one uh, that really is very close uh, to um, uh, to the, the the Central European countries but also to Russia. Angela Merkel uh, is playing, uh, in my view, a very important role as the one who knows Russia very well. She, she speaks Russian uh, very well. And uh, Angela Merkel uh, is um, developing a, a policy that tries to keep the middle between all yeah. those different uh, scenarios. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is also so indeed France at this moment with uh, uh, President Macron um, who certainly uh, as a young uh, president has his own interests in those uh, uh, relations with Russia and you know that in the past also mm -hmm. France had a very important yeah. um, uh, uh, relation to Russia uh, the aristocracy for example in St. Petersburg uh, uh, and perhaps also in other parts of Russia, they spoke French. Eh? There was the, the, the French connection that was very strong and they knew uh, the French uh, uh, literature uh, very well. So um, I think there is a special relation with, uh, with France as well. Yeah, uh, but well, so you can you can go on and and, and talk about uh, uh, the relation with Greece, for example, yeah. is also very good. The relation between Russia and Greece, uh, and so on. Russia of course, and Italy, those Russia individual Italy. countries yeah. will not be so strong as uh, uh, being together in uh, a, a consortium, be it the European Union or be it perhaps a core Europe as we call it eh? a new yeah. core Europe for the countries that really want to, to go to Russia with a very constructive um, aim eh? mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is a possible a possible scenario um, uh, for the future but uh, we will see I think that uh, the European Union has been very blind in uh, its relation with uh, with Russia, that it was very Eurocentric, 
very concentrated on itself and that it did not see how Russia was standing in the world as um, a newly independent state after the collapse of the Soviet Union with its own interests, its own national state interests. And I think that at least uh, the European Union should listen very carefully to those national uh, interests of Russia. Okay, uh, Professor Malfleet, I know you speak Russian, so <laughs> I, I would like to thank you in Russian. Большое спасибо за ваш очень интересный разговор, за ваш интересный рассказ, и это очень ценно видеть и знать мнение из центра Европы, из Бельгии, которая в самом-самом центре Европы, в которой принимается много решений. Большое спасибо вам за ваш рассказ. Всего вам доброго. Спасибо. Спасибо, что были с нами. До новых встреч.